ask, what type of relationship exists between FDA and State Department's... This health? summer, in a congressional hearing room in Washington, the Federal Food and Drug Administration sounded a warning about the nation's blood supply. This industry is not assuming adequate responsibility for putting in place and then following the basic quality assurance programs required to assure the safety of the blood supply. As head of the FDA, Dr. David Kessler is responsible for blood safety. These were system-wide problems that were not being addressed at the national level of the American Red Cross. When it became clear that at the center of the FDA's recent action is the American Red Cross, which collects more than half of the nation's blood. Together with other independent blood banks and companies that collect blood products, it's a system that generates more than a billion dollars a year. But for the last decade, it has been an industry under siege. In September of this year, a lawsuit was filed against blood product companies on behalf of 10,000 hemophiliacs who were infected with the AIDS virus through the blood supply. There's been lies all the way down the line. And it's gonna come out, hopefully with a congressional hearing, it's gonna come out. And I hope the world knows the truth before I die. Because I'll tell you, I've got an appointment soon to die. It is now estimated that as many as 30,000 Americans were infected with AIDS through blood. It's a tragedy that has exposed critical weaknesses in the rules and practices of blood banking. It's also a story of missed opportunities, vested interests, and lax regulation, stretching back more than a decade to when a mysterious virus entered America's bloodstream. Even in San Francisco in 1981, the new disease that had appeared in the city's homosexual community was thought of as their problem. People called it gay cancer. The doctors had named the disease gay-related immune deficiency, or GRID. At the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, doctors were concerned about the spread of GRID. Donald Francis was an epidemiologist at the CDC. When I saw this situation in occurring in humans that look very much like feline leukemia, that is the immunologic and cancer uh, problems that AIDS patients have, I put the, it together very quickly, as did Max Essex, and we were on the phone immediately in 1981 talking about this as a possibility of, of being an infectious agent. Dr. Francis sent blood samples from people with GRID to Harvard's Cancer Biology Laboratory run by Dr. Max Essex, one of the world's leading experts in retrovirology. Well, Don Francis and I both endorsed the hypothesis that this new disease was more likely to be an infectious disease. But not everyone agreed. Because we were th Nobody at that time really knew what was causing the disease, of course, and probably the leading hypothesis was something to do with the gay male lifestyle. Either it would take the scientific establishment more than two years to recognize that Francis and Essex were right. GRID was, in fact, an infectious disease. It would spread rapidly among gay men through sexual contact. But it would also spread undetected through America's blood supply, infecting thousands. In the mid-1970s, gay men began donating blood as part of an effort to help find a vaccine against another disease, hepatitis B. Back then, the only way to make a vaccine was to draw blood from people who already had been infected with hepatitis B. And as many as three quarters of the gay men in some cities were carrying the virus. Bruce Voller was the executive director of the National Gay Task Force in those years. Well, I remember a lot of people that I knew. In fact, we, you know, pushed uh, for it uh, in you know, an array of gay organizations that this was a useful thing to do, that hepatitis was a, a major scourge for gay males, and that it would be a very important and valuable thing to find a solution uh, and a way of, of dealing with this and preventing it. The American Red Cross operated blood collection centers in big cities. 
where they targeted blood drives in the homosexual community. Their strategy was successful. By the early 80s, gay men made up 15% of all Red Cross blood donors. But what none of them knew was that blood not only carried hepatitis, but also the new disease, GRID. Then in 1982 at the CDC, there were reports of GRID-like symptoms appearing in another group, hemophiliacs. When the CD4 studies came forth from the hemophiliacs showing that, what was it, 30% or more had abnormal immunologic tests, and the same thing was coming through with the gay community, then the issue was there's a huge hidden chunk to this iceberg and that uh, we were in a far uh, worse situation than we had realized. Like gay men, hemophiliacs were chronically infected with hepatitis B. The virus was passed to them through injections of a blood product called Factor VIII, which they had to take to stop their uncontrolled bleeding. Factor VIII kept hemophiliacs alive and allowed them to live normal lives. When the first hemophiliacs died of the new disease, CDC called an emergency meeting in July 1982 to warn that their clotting factor might be contaminated. The National Hemophilia Foundation made it very clear that this material was revolutionary, revolutionized their lives and revolutionized their survival. And please do not take it away, even though it does have a risk. Dr. Louis Allodort, then medical advisor to the National Hemophilia Foundation, says he was unconvinced by the CDC's warning. Now, to look at what CDC was investigating in research at that time to give you some idea of what people began to think about what caused this disease, they were injecting sperm into mice to see whether sperm caused HIV. But they didn't know. It wasn't called HIV. It wasn't anything. It was causing this disease. Before the meeting, a key CDC scientist had written to Dr. Allodort suggesting the possibility that the causal agent is a virus producing immunosuppression transmitted in a manner similar to hepatitis. We were so unfamiliar with a retrovirus that it was beyond the ken of most people that you could have a disease based on something that happened years ago. The meeting ended with no consensus, except everyone knew it was no longer just a gay-related disease. It would be called Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, AIDS. I made the only motion that got passed in that entire meeting. Every motion except my motion to change the name to AIDS got voted down. At the Stanford University Blood Center, Dr. Ed Engelman was one of the few blood bankers to take the CDC's warning seriously. And it was quite surprising at that time that um, there was a tendency by the blood bankers and by the leadership to dissociate what happened to the hemophiliac patients with what might happen to recipients of blood transfusions. Somehow there was, suddenly there was a big difference between receiving factors derived from blood and receiving the blood itself, which made absolutely no sense whatsoever because historically it was well known that the hemophiliacs were traditionally the first to get a new infectious agent. The reason hemophiliacs are vulnerable is that it takes plasma from as many as 20,000 different donors to extract one bottle of clotting factor. We were alarmed, and we would have thought that anyone associated with blood banking or the transfusion industry would have been equally alarmed. Throughout 1982, the evidence continued to mount that AIDS was being transmitted by blood. Then the CDC announced an AIDS case that had nothing to do with gay men or hemophiliacs. By December came the uh, um, blood-associated cases, especially the child in San Francisco who had received platelets from a, uh, a donor, and both of them had developed AIDS. The baby was not known to have any other risk factor. That sounded like the type of event that had to be associated with acquisition of infectious agent and infectious agent transmitted in blood. The CDC presented this new evidence to a meeting of clotting factor producers in California. 
And I was literally knocked off my chair because he said, here's this new disease. It's bloodborne. It's a retrovirus, we think. Uh, it's doubling every six months, and it's 100% fatal. Now, you don't have to be an epidemiologist or... or a if AIDS was making its way into his product, then Dries decided he had to do something about it. Human blood. I know. I'm Tom Dries, president of Alpha Therapeutic Corporation. He decided to screen out homosexual men from his plasma donors. Like other commercial producers of Factor 8, Alpha ran collection centers in poor neighborhoods where people could sell their plasma each week for up to $25. We adopted very stringent screening program, which was to ask people verbally, face to face, not on a checkoff card, which, have you ever had sex with a male, to, this to a male donor. The first two weeks, we had 308 donors get up and say, yes, I've, I'm, I'm a homosexual or I've had a homosexual relationship with a man, and we'd say, thank you very much, and he left. We had another 500 who didn't admit to anything, but got up and left. Other manufacturers of Factor 8 were reluctant to ask donors directly about homosexual practices. One, one group said to me, uh, you're going to turn a donor down, he's going to walk out the door, he's going to walk down the street, come into my place, and we'll take him all day long. And you're a sucker, you're a jerk for doing this. Well, sorry, that's the way we see it. In Washington, the CDC presented the same evidence to the FDA's Blood Products Advisory Committee. But the committee made no recommendation to the FDA then. And its chairman, Dr. Joseph Bovey, would say that gays should not be prevented from donating blood. We have not been willing, because there's not enough evidence, to finger any population or subset of individuals and say, this group should not be allowed to donate blood. But indeed... Screening out homosexuals was a policy Dr. Bovey and other blood bankers advising the FDA would strongly oppose in meetings with the CDC. They never listened. The blood bankers, the, the, the responsibility, frankly, the federal government was very limited in its resources, including the FDA and CDC, and the responsibility at that meeting was turned over to the blood bankers. And they were the only ones that could respond fast enough. The FDA could help them do it, but it was really their response. They had all the information. We spelled out that there was such thing as transfusion-associated AIDS, that it was associated with the donation of blood and plasma from, from gay men and that you could identify that either from taking histories of individuals, which many of us had lots of experience in public health doing, or from testing the blood for a variety of tests. So we, we put the problem, and we gave them the solution, and they chose to ignore it. Well, Bove, as I recall, was head of the blood bank at uh, uh, Yale University Medical Center. And so uh, his motive, in my view, was uh, uh, let's keep the cost down, let's not upset the donor population. There was a problem. Dries saw another problem, a revolving door between the blood bankers and regulators at the FDA. There are the people who put in 20 years in the FDA and then go across the street and work for the Red Cross, and people who do the, in the work in the Red Cross for 20 years go to work for the FDA. So there is that, and plus the fact that it isn't just the Red Cross and the FDA. The people work in the FDA and then come to work for the various uh, plasma fraction manufacturers as well. On January 4, 1983, in response to mounting pressure from the CDC, the U.S. Public Health Service called its first public meeting on transfusion-associated AIDS. Donald Drake, a medical reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer, was one of the few journalists there. Oh, there, there are four very long tables. I guess there are about 38 people, I remember, at the four tables. There's a great expanse of 20 yards from one side of the table to the other, and they would talk across this chasm at each other. Clearly, Don Francis was the most forceful person at the meeting, as I remember. And he was, he was much stronger than any of the other CDC people in speaking out. That meeting was meant to say, yes, there was such a thing as transfusion-associated AIDS. That was the first thing. And it was laid out what the epidemiology was. I think we had five other cases besides the baby at that time, and that maybe half of those were uh, investigated completely, and we found one donor in all the donors to these individuals who was a gay man, um, and one of which had gotten AIDS uh, uh, as the recipient had gotten AIDS. So it all looked very clear that there was such a thing. 
Second, that the thing was associated with the donation of blood from people who got AIDS, which at that time was about 75% gay, and yet intravenous drug users are, aren't big blood donors. And so it really was the donation from a gay man that was associated with the disease. So this is what, if there is such a thing, this is how it's transmitted. And then the recommendations, logically, we have to eliminate gay men from blood donation or uh, if they do donate blood, to eliminate their blood. They recommended that a, a series of tests, but the one that seemed easiest for us to implement was to do a surrogate test for hepatitis B core antibody. And they found a 88% correlation between that test and patients that had AIDS. When we made the, the, the recommendation for hepatitis B testing of, of the donors, we said that they would lose 5% of the donors. And we thought that was a reasonable um, uh, cost to balance the benefits. The industry, the, the volunteer industry, was particularly strongly and adamantly opposed uh, at those meetings to uh, using the hepatitis B core antibody test as a surrogate test for screening out uh, infected blood because of the cost. It was, a, it was as simple as that. It was, a, from their point of view, that was going to add a great deal to uh, to their costs and the loss of their profits. Then the blood bank would get up and say, surrogate testing is very expensive and we can do it through screening. And then the gay community would come up and they'd say, as soon as you start screening, it will be counterproductive because gay men won't say they're gay and they'll continue to give blood. They were big blood donors, if you recall. Very conscious, uh, oriented people and community oriented and gave lots of blood the gay population went crazed how could you single us out as people who shouldn't give blood and it was a wild meeting uh, people were yelling and screaming uh, many of them at us because we of, of our direct questioning of donors Joe Bovian uh, uh, from the American Association of Blood Banks and Aaron Kellner from the New York Blood Center suddenly led this almost a revolt to the whole concept that there was such a thing as transfusion-associated AIDS. So if there was no such thing as transfusion-associated AIDS, then you didn't have to do anything about it. The other people seem to be saying, let's do something, but let's not do this because it's going to hurt our vested interest. Uh, Francis seemed to be saying, let's do something. Confident that there were going to be more cases, because clearly they were coming in by the day. I said, let's just, if you people don't believe it's, there's such a thing as transfusion-associated AIDS now, just give us a number. Give us a number. Is it 10? Is it 20? Is it 30? Is it 40? And say, when we get that threshold, then we will act. OK, let's agree on that. Now, after you agree on that, then let's say what we're going to do when we act. So since we're all here together now, we can decide if we get there. If we don't get there, then we don't have to act. If we do get there, we will act. Well, that was a ploy that didn't work, obviously. Uh, it just increased their ire more, and uh, the, the meeting continued to go spiraling downhill. <laughs> Tragic. Don Francis was never invited to another FDA blood products advisory meeting. He eventually resigned from the CDC. And this is an excellent example, I, I think. It's almost like a laboratory experiment of when vested interests come into conflict with the bigger good, which side will people side with? And I think what we see is almost invariably they will side with the vested interest. The American Association of Blood Banks is the industry's trade group. Together with the American Red Cross, they quickly issued a joint statement. Direct or indirect questions about a donor's sexual preference are inappropriate. Dr. Paul Holland was a member of the AABB's executive board. So how could you screen out a high-risk donor if you didn't ask them if they were homosexual? Well, among the things that they were told at that meeting by these representatives of the gay community was it would be both inappropriate and counterproductive to directly confront people about their sexual preference. They said, if anything, you make the blood supply less safe. Convinced their civil rights were at stake, gay activists were threatening the blood banks. He was a major figure in the gay movement. Uh, had in fact proposed that and argued that and I had called him and said what? that that uh, gays should just go and donate the, their blood and then later call up and say so and and screw everything up 
uh, as a way well, of blo uh, blocking the attempt to utilize screening as a uh, that kind of screening as a way of uh, dealing with the issue. Dr. Art Silverglide, president of the AABB, was the medical director of the San Bernardino Blood Bank at that time. We were not immune to their pressure, and their pressure was that this would have been discriminatory. The Haitians applied a lot of pressure when uh, blood from Haiti was uh, uh, being discriminated against, and that question was removed for a while. There's a, you can't do everything in the society just because it's right, even though you'd like to. The FDA went along with the blood industry, adopting the AABB guidelines, rejecting the CDC scientists' recommendations. But the Stanford Blood Bank split with the rest of the industry. It became the first blood bank to institute a surrogate blood test for AIDS. But well, we estimate that we prevented, you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 cases of AIDS in our medical center alone. And I would also point out to you that we had one, one individual that came in and donated here and tested positive in our test, and we did not use his blood. This individual donated 15 times uh, to other blood banks. And our estimate is that he probably, you know, transmitted AIDS to 50 or 100 people because each blood donation is separated into at least two or three components. Dr. Bovey remained skeptical that the AIDS virus had entered the blood supply. Uh, Clearly, there is some concern on the part of uh, public health officials, physicians, blood bankers, and the public that uh, AIDS, whatever it is, is into the blood supply. The evidence for this, in my view, is very weak and very early. We don't really have any proof yet that the nation's blood supply is contaminated. We're not screening people, nor are we screening blood. There is no test. While he publicly downplayed the risks, Three weeks before, he had written a confidential report to the board of the American Association of Blood Banks. In it, Dr. Bovey acknowledges the increased probability that AIDS may be spread by blood. I believe that the most we can do in this situation is buy time, he wrote. There is little doubt in my mind that additional transfusion-related cases and additional cases in patients with hemophilia will surface. In fact, by that time, Many hemophiliacs already had been infected with HIV. Well, we know, for instance, that in the hemophilia population, although the virus entered the system in 1978, the bulk of the virus really came between 81 and 83, and 50% of our patients had zero converted by January of 82 before the first case. So more than 50% of our patient population were infected before we even saw the first case of AIDS in hemophiliac. Corey Dubin is a hemophiliac. It was really hard to face that the very product that had made my whole life better now potentially was going to take my life at a very early age. I remember asking my doctors, what do I do? You know, what's going on? And they'd say, we think it's OK. You've got to treat the bleeds. Corey Dubin is convinced that hemophiliacs were not warned clearly enough by their own medical advisors. If they had mailed out an 83 warning, we must talk, you must think about these issues. Of course not everybody would have responded. Of course some people would have stayed under the woodwork. But a lot of us would have walked into a meeting and sat down and said, what do we do? What do you think we do? But they claim they sent notices to people. They did. I don't believe they did. There was no major effort. Look, they turned to the companies and they said, is there a problem? And the companies down the line said, don't worry, use the product. But there was a problem. According to Milton Mosen, the former medical research director of Cutter Laboratories, by the end of 1983, he knew that the hemophiliac's clotting factor could transmit AIDS and that virtually all lots of concentrate were contaminated with the AIDS virus. You'll never convince me that profit margins and fear of product liability and fear of losing a very lucrative business did not drive the CEOs and the leaders of these companies. Corey Dubin found out he was HIV positive in 1985. 
He is now part of a class action suit against the five manufacturers and the National Hemophilia Foundation. He believes they could have acted more urgently after 1983, not just for him, but for others. Clearly one of the greatest tragedies of the epidemic that in many ways were really brought up in that January meeting uh, with the blood banks and the public health service all together were new hemophiliacs clearly being born uh, into the society. And there, there was such a thing as uh, transfusion-associated AIDS. There were ways to avoid transfusion-associated AIDS and factor eight associated AIDS. Why don't at least they get the benefits recognizing that some have already been infected? And any new people coming into this group clearly should have not gotten HIV. On September 20th, 1983, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Maria Hannafant gave birth to her first child, Eddie Jr. Eddie was diagnosed as a factor nine hemophiliac. I remember that it was very vague the way it was told to me. Of course, I was in a state of shock at the time too. I was a brand new mom to begin with. I had never heard the word hemophilia in my life till my son was diagnosed. And we were barely starting to hear things about HIV. So the Hennepins had seen news reports on AIDS and hemophiliacs. They told their doctors that they were afraid of Eddie getting AIDS. We got introduced to a hematologist, and I asked her, because at the time there was information about HIV in the news. I said, what is this I'm reading in the paper about this HIV and this AIDS? And she says, well, that's something you shouldn't have to worry about. And, you know, because I always remember that. What we were always the Hannafin's fears were allayed. Also, because their son was a factor nine hemophiliac, and Eddie would only need the clotting factor rarely, as little as four times a year. Two months after Eddie was born, the FDA held a meeting with the major manufacturers of clotting factor. By then, the number of hemophiliacs with AIDS had reached 21. The government was fully recognizing that there was a substantial problem of AIDS in the blood supply, and they, and they invited uh, participants from all over the blood industry, as well as academicians like myself, to come to this meeting and present our findings and our views. Um, I presented, for example, the kind of testing that we were doing in our blood bank uh, as a surrogate test to reduce the likelihood of AIDS in the blood supply. Others described their other tests, and the test that seemed to make the most sense economically and feasibility-wise was the antibody to hepatitis B core. The night before that meeting, officials from the four major clotting factor producers, Alpha, Highland Baxter, Armour, and Cutter, held a private meeting in a suburban Washington hotel room. This Cutter memo describes how, at that meeting, the companies agreed to propose a task force to study the question of testing as a delaying tactic. The following morning, their proposal was adopted by the FDA. Several different surrogate tests would be considered and evaluated by the task force subcommittee. This committee didn't issue a report for six or eight months. And ultimately, a majority and minority report was issued with the majority favoring no testing and the minority favoring the institution of hepatitis B core. So the ultimate outcome of that meeting was nothing, no testing. By the time he was three years old, Eddie Hannafant had been given only 12 injections of clotting factor. But by then, he was already showing early symptoms of HIV infection. I didn't see any danger in it because I didn't know. So any time that he got hurt, my, in, my thing was, you know, I'm going to take my kid and safe. give him the factor to You'll take good care of him because I thought that that would take care of him and he would be, you know, healthy. I didn't know. Sometimes I thought and I felt guilt over maybe one of those days that now maybe he did, didn't really maybe need the factor that badly. He could have gone maybe without the factor. Maybe that was the, the bottle that maybe gave him the HIV. And, and it really hurts. It really hurts. 
Eddie Hannafant is one of more than 800 children born with hemophilia in 1983 and 1984. Estimates are that dozens of these children contracted the AIDS virus through their clotting factor. 83 and 84 were the lost years. Um, and they were lost on the first year because of the uh, Joe Bovey, AABB, Red Cross, bury your head in the sand approach to, to AIDS. The first year, they just kind of ignored it. And then came uh, the second year, starting in January of, uh, or December of 83, going onwards, where the Blood Product Advisory Committee said, OK, now we really do need to recommend uh, uh, hepatitis B testing, at least. And then they all voted, well, we need a task force to evaluate it. And by the time the task force got to evaluate it, then uh, Margaret Heckler and Bob Gallo stood up and said, now we're going to have a test. And so a whole other year goes by, and they still did nothing. Um, and so this combination of the first year of sticking your head in the sand and the second year having your expectations come that we have an HIV test around the corner when you knew it was going to take a long time, um, just combined to kill uh, tens of thousands of Americans. Finally, there was a breakthrough. In 1985, the FDA announced a blood test. This test adds a major dimension of protection to our present safeguards. Its use will keep our blood supplies safe and indeed make them even safer. This test the HIV antibody test, called the ELISA test, test would help make the blood supply in large part safe. But it came at a cost to the blood banks. Technicians had to be hired and trained, donors checked, and every new unit of blood tested and logged. But astonishingly, the blood banks were not required to go back to the inventory on their shelves and test the blood. Now, in hindsight, Dr. Art Silverglide at the American Association of Blood Banks says it was a mistake. We test, we test an inventory. We didn't do it then. I have no and you're really, excuse. And you're really telling us that, that that was an honest mistake and not motivated by things like not wanting to hire extra people, not wanting to go to the inconvenience of having blood banks test all of their inventory? I don't, uh, I can't get back 10 years to tell you whether all those things played in, but I really believe that it was an honest mistake. The blood banks were used to doing things their own way. They had even persuaded the FDA to reduce the number of inspections of blood banks. Gilbert Gall is a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. I stumbled upon a document in which the blood banks were talking about how they had success, successfully lobbied um, uh, the regulators to reduce the number of inspections to one every two years as opposed to one every year. So Investigating words, safety in the blood supply, Gall found that the FDA reduced the number of inspections at the very time the AIDS virus was entering the system. Even if you accept the idea that, well, we didn't know in 83 that, that AIDS was in the blood supply, I mean, we sure as hell knew that it was in the blood supply a year later. And why wouldn't, why wouldn't you have gone back at that point in time and increased your inspections so that you, know, you, could, you could police bad blood getting out the door? But they didn't do it. I mean, that didn't come until 1988 when all of a sudden everything exploded and the blood banks started having all these horrendous problems and all these recalls. Gold discovered FDA reports of errors and accidents. That between 1985 and 1987, thousands of units of potentially contaminated blood had been released and then officially recalled. Recalling blood that has been released for transfusion uh, is a bit misleading uh, because depending on when and how you're trying to recall it, the chances of your being able to get it all back are almost zero because once it's released, it's used. Potentially contaminated blood had been used, most of it quickly in emergency rooms. The FDA had to take action. In September 1988, the FDA and the Red Cross entered into what is known as a voluntary agreement to comply with all FDA regulations. From now on, there would be yearly inspections. Mary Carton was an experienced FDA field inspector. FDA's job is, is twofold, as I see it, from my perspective. The first part is that we should set a standard for them to meet, and then the second part is to enforce that standard. 
and uh, over and over again, while they will agree with us about the standard that we're setting, when we come to enforce it, they suddenly want to discuss with us maybe the merits of that standard. And yes, Mary Carden was promoted and assigned to on-site inspections of Red Cross blood centers that previously had been cited for chronic safety violations. This document shows the violations she found in Red Cross blood banks in Albany, Charlotte, Nashville, Los Angeles, St. Louis, Tulsa, and Washington, D.C., where Cardin found 230 cases of possible transfusion-associated AIDS. None of these cases was ever reported to the FDA. The bottom line was that the Red Cross didn't tell the FDA about those cases whether they were true t transfusion associated cases or not. And, and, and the FDA inspectors, Mary Cardin and others who went into national and went into the Washington region and looked at the files, found out about these things and realized that they had not been reported to the FDA and they raised red flags about that issue. I wrote the story and all hell broke loose. Questions about the Red Cross were raised by a congressional subcommittee on blood safety. Uh, the Red Cross uh, on July 10th, Ms. Cardin put out uh, a statement, and one of the things that they said, talking about error and accident reports, uh, and I, I want to just quote to you, they call them procedural errors which are corrected immediately at the local level and then routinely reported to national headquarters, which in turn reports them to the FDA. Uh, is that possibly a true statement? <laughs> Not to my knowledge. <laughs> I thank the county. When Mary Carden and the FDA inspectors tried to get records from Red Cross National Headquarters, they were not forthcoming. Generally, when I object to something during an, during an inspection, uh, the firm is very prompt at trying to provide some information for me to show that they've already corrected the deficiency or are going to do the best they can. And in the case of this inspection of the American Red Cross at National Headquarters, that type of attitude did not prevail. Um, there were when no Cardin requested all of the case files, the Red Cross officials replied that the cases were in the office of their general counsel in case of litigation. In November of 1989, Bob Jones, a carpenter from Wilsall, Montana, was in Portland, Oregon, visiting his son when he was rushed into emergency surgery with a burst artery. Jones was transfused with blood from the Portland Red Cross blood bank. A few months later, he was called by the blood bank's director, Dr. Franz Pitoum. And he said he was sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but that I had been given a a unit of blood that was possibly that was contaminated with the HIV virus. And uh, I was just totally shocked. I didn't believe that could happen. So Shirley come boiling out then, and she took the telephone, and she talked to him, but I was unable to talk. I, I just couldn't understand that. I asked Dr. Patum about the donor, and he said uh, he wasn't at liberty to give details, and I pressed for details, and he finally said that he was homosexual. And I asked him uh, why they would take blood from a homosexual when they knew all this AIDS was out there in the homosexual community. And uh, he said, uh, well, the donor had not disclosed that. Dr. Pitone told me that I shouldn't tell anyone about this, that, uh, it was none of their business, and that family and friends might ostracize me if uh, I did tell it. The Portland Red Cross has had its share of problems with the FDA. A year after Dr. Pitoum contacted Bob Jones, Mary Carden went to Portland to conduct a full inspection. The Portland inspection of March 1991 was just simply a routine inspection request from... Cardin's inspection revealed numerous significant violations, including the release of blood improperly tested for hepatitis and HIV. Portland was sent a notice of intent to revoke its license to test blood. There was a notice of intent to revoke their license sent to the Portland Red Cross. Mary Cardin had discovered that units of potentially contaminated blood had been released. 
Once more, she testified before the Congressional Subcommittee. Do you know if, uh, in fact, the blood was shipped or not? I do not have all the records with me to indicate which of the products were distributed versus maybe expired in-house, but we do have records that they were shipped. Whether they were actually transfused, we would have to go to the hospital and, and um, um, ask them that information. In fact, these records show that recalled blood units from the Portland Blood Center were transfused, including units that had been incorrectly tested or had come from high-risk donors. And if a person is At the time, Dr. Pitoum insisted there was no danger. No blood reached hospitals that we feel uncomfortable with. No units have been released that were incompletely tested or were released with the wrong test results or were not tested at all. And, and so this is just erroneous. Rather than have its license revoked by the FDA, in July 1991, the Portland Blood Bank voluntarily surrendered its license to test blood. But seven months later, Dr. Pitoum notified the FDA that Portland had resumed HIV testing without FDA official approval. Within 24 hours, Mary Carden arrived in Portland and closed the HIV testing unit down, citing Portland for inadequate review of testing records inappropriate release of blood products, and releasing blood even before receiving HIV test results. We sent copies of the FDA inspection reports on Portland to Dr. Ed Engelman for his evaluation. Uh, it's apparent to me that there are serious violations, violations of conduct uh, that would place recipients of blood transfusions at considerable risk. Example would be to release blood for transfusion blood that has been donated but has either not been tested, tested for HIV, for example, or tested for hepatitis, but released anyway for transfusion. That, to me, represents a serious, absolutely reprehensible uh, breach of uh, not only guidelines, but common sense. Meanwhile, back in Montana, Bob Jones had hired local attorney Monty Beck whose first action was to go looking for the blood donor. It wasn't easy. He got no help from the Portland Red Cross. And when, after months of investigation, Beck finally located the donor, he did not fit the description Dr. Pitoum had given Bob Jones. He wasn't a homosexual and he didn't lie. He just simply wasn't asked the right questions. And if he had been asked the right questions, he flatly stated he wouldn't have given his blood. It took three years for Bob Jones's case to come to court. The Red Cross lawyers argued that the blood he'd received had tested negative and that the Portland Blood Center screened the donor properly. But then, in a surprise move... I mean, it just makes sense to resolve a case like this and avoid further litigation and expense, and fortunately... We... Before the donor could testify on Bob Jones' behalf, the Red Cross settled the case admitting no negligence and sealing the case records. Tom Drees says there have been many other settlements of transfusion-associated AIDS cases. To be. I saw some figures at the recent AABB meeting that, uh, that court settlements, not settlements outside, but, but uh, trial settlements have, have come up with $65 million. I mean, that's serious uh, money. The highest numbers of transfusion-associated AIDS cases occurred before 1985. Since the ELISA test, there are far fewer of them. But no one knows how many cases there are, and blood banks are not required to report cases of HIV infection to the FDA or the CDC. In 1992, at the Los Angeles Red Cross, FDA inspectors found nearly 100 cases where lookbacks notifying recipients of possible HIV-infected blood had not been performed for several years. It is the responsibility of the blood bank to go back to the recipients of those transfusions and make sure that they are aware uh, that they may have become infected, in this case, an HIV infection. Uh, and if one delays that look back by weeks, months, years, all you're doing is making it more likely that that recipient has suffered from AIDS without knowing it 
that that recipient has potentially transmitted AIDS to other individuals, sexually and otherwise. And so there is no good reason that I can think of to delay a look back. Finally, in 1993, FDA Commissioner Dr. David Kessler went to federal court and obtained an injunction against the Red Cross for failure to fulfill its promises under the 1988 Voluntary Agreement. We filed a complaint for injunctive relief in the district court, and we obtained a consent decree in May of this year that put the American Red Cross under court supervision. The, the injunction that applies to the American Red Cross applies to all the facilities throughout this country, all American Red Cross blood banking facilities, both in the field and in headquarters. It doesn't apply to any one uh, blood banking facility over another. All facilities are covered by the injunction. The complaint specifically cites safety violations in the Albany, Charleston, and Portland blood centers. There were examples of the problems that we had seen and the reason why we went from a voluntary agreement that was signed in 1988 to a court-enforced uh, injunction. There, there are all these voluntary agreements between the FDA and, and these problem blood banks. And uh, it's like a consent decree. You know, the, the person who's signing the consent decree will always tell you that, well, I haven't been convicted of anything. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm just agreeing not to do this thing in the in the future. And um, that's what the same spin that the blood banks put on it when they, when they run afoul of, uh, of the regulations. Uh, they volunteer to, to fix these things. Of course, when you go back and look later, uh, a year or more later, whether those things were ever fixed, I mean, um, from the examples that we've seen, um, it's often as not they've, they've never been fixed. They still have those kinds of problems. Red Cross National Headquarters has been reluctant to discuss the details of its past problems. But Fred Kyle, who was hired less than two years ago as a senior executive, did respond to the FDA's recent injunction. So I, so I think what gives them comfort uh, is, yes, there is some formality and legality to the, this arrangement that they didn't have, have before. Uh, they were disappointed in the Red Cross's response to the voluntary agreement that they were, that it wasn't as quick as, as they thought, and so this perhaps gives them more assurance. And, and I'm not saying I'm happy with that, but I understand that. Right. Well, Dr. So, Kessler but, but, puts but, it another way. He says he needs the courts to get the Red Cross to fix the violations well, I, I, that it I, refuses to fix. He knows I disagree with him on that. Uh, Dr. Kessler doesn't have as much faith as I do in the management control that we absolutely have in this organization, and we will exercise it. During the 18, last 18 months, while we have made a lot of progress, we have also had mistakes, we have had false starts, we've had to do things over again. The Red Cross claims that it is spending $148 million on a transformation program to improve the standards of its blood centers. Continue to do. But we have to remember this is a big job. We are changing the tires on the truck as we're going down the highway. And we've never done this before. We are completely... Kyle insists the transformation program is not connected to the Red Cross's recent problems with the FDA. We shouldn't be relating this to current safety or the AIDS problem or HIV. We, this is a future-related system to make us able to uh, deal with any challenges that we might have in the 21st century or later in the 1990s. This is a forward-looking program to change the way we run the blood system. Right. But the blood system that we're running now, Carol, is indeed as safe as it can be made. And, 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 I, and I think the numbers we have demonstrate that. Each part of the blood industry seems to have its own numbers about how many cases of HIV infection have happened since 1985 from blood transfusions. From the blood bankers to the CDC to the FDA, there is no central system for gathering that information. 12 million units are uh, donated every year. And so when asked, Dr. Kessler has to guess how many cases there are annually. That translates into somewhere between 90 and 450, 460 cases, if my memory serves me uh, correct. For Gilbert Gall, who won a Pulitzer in 1990 for his reporting, 
It sounds like an old story. The numbers were, were suspect. Um, to some extent, they're still suspect. Um, I don't have a whole lot of faith in them. Um, flipping it, that's not to say that um, you know, the blood supply is, is, is just incredibly unsafe and just full of AIDS. I mean, nobody's saying that. Nobody's even suggesting that. Um, but God, I mean, we ought to have at least better data. And we ought to have um, the top public officials in this country um, you know, speaking honestly with, with the American public about the risks. Now FDA Commissioner Kessler is sending a clear message to the blood industry. This was one of the strongest enforcement actions that I have taken during my tenure as commissioner of FDA. And we followed it by strengthening our enforcement activities across the entire blood industry. We are but his challenge is whether his field inspectors can bring the problem blood banks into compliance. Earlier this year at the Portland Red Cross, we found that the blood bank had resumed HIV testing. Heidi Patterson is the technical director. And when did you start up again? Uh, January of 93. Okay, January of 93. And that was based on a letter from the FDA yes. saying that your license is... Been amended to resume testing in Portland, Oregon. And since then, anybody from the FDA ever show up here to inspect? Not in this center, to my knowledge. I mean, I, I just don't know it. Uh, well, well, we were just kind of astounded. We asked Dr. Kessler about the letter and why, after all its problems, the FDA hadn't been back to re-inspect the Portland blood bank. There have been, uh, there are real problems. We have seen violations um, throughout uh, this industry and that's the reason why we went I mean to an injunction I mean it was a very strong action it's not something that we did lightly okay. it was something that look the, but why the, hasn't anybody been back to Portland to do a full inspection in two years and four months is my question and on what grounds are they performing this test I, I'd like to get an answer because when, when was the last Portland inspection well I can't tell you the specifics of each and every inspection has been conducted in Portland and some of the issues there are not are unresolved issues that I'd prefer not to address. I mean, what, what, what chances are that? When was the last time Portland was inspected? Okay. Soon after this interview, in July 1993, FDA inspectors went to Portland for the first full inspection in over two years. The inspection cited 35 violations during the month of January 1993, including failure to properly perform the ELISA test.